Welcome to this introduction on Streamlit for data scientists. So Streamlit, what is it? Why should you use it? And how do you use it? Streamlit is a Python package for creating user interfaces that's incredibly easy to use and get started with and can be used to create interactive web apps. It can be installed with pip install Streamlit. And if you haven't seen one before, it looks a little bit like this, where you've got a sidebar on the left and a main window where components are rendered from top to bottom. It comes with loads of pre-built components in its library, things like buttons, expanders, multi-select drop-down boxes, titles, charts, and plenty of others. It's got a really good community as well. The documentation is excellent. And if there's something that you want that isn't in their component library, then there's plenty of components that have been made by the community. One of my favorites is a PDF viewer. Before we get stuck in, I just thought I'd take the chance to show you some things that other people have built with Streamlit, which might give you some of your own ideas about how you could use Streamlit. Starting with this great tool that's relevant to data science, streamlit.app. This guy has built a data science and analysis tool where you can select a toy data set, select the columns you want to use, do any filtering on the columns, resampling, modeling, you name it, evaluation, and then you can see the results of that run on the main screen. So this is a perfect use case for data science where you can select the entire parameters of your training run and then immediately see the output if it's a small data set or monitor the training and then see the output. And because you have complete control over the charts and the data that's displayed, you really can get your hands right into the center of the algorithm to see what's going on. So that's one example. Another example is this one here where a guy has hosted his entire course on a Streamlit app. It's used dark theme, it's embedded YouTube videos, He's done all sorts of great stuff, even got a certificate that you can apply for. So that's another really good example. This other one is more of an AI focused app where you can enter your prompts and you can convert the text into images and play around a little bit. They've got some examples here. They've got this kind of custom component that they've used, which must be a community component. It's used custom fonts, custom colors. And the last one is one without the sidebar with just a single page where you can analyze your Goodreads profile and have a look at what are the books that you read by age, by the number of books, how users rate your reads, and how you rate your reads. So those are a few examples, but you can go and find more in the app gallery of all sorts of things if you ever need inspiration or want to see examples of what other people have used. Right, let's get stuck back into the tutorial. So the reason you should use Streamlit as a data scientist, the main reason anyway, is the feedback cycle. Whenever you make a change to your code or whenever you interact with a component on the front end, Streamlit is going to re-execute your code, which in turn updates the front end and allows you to make even further changes. I think this type of approach for developing applications and data science models is really useful, especially recently with language models and agentic applications where you might want a qualitative analysis rather than a purely quantitative one from metrics. Some direct applications for data science, though, are creating dashboards and perhaps monitoring model training progress. And for exploration processes like EDA, creating plots. You could even create web apps that you deploy to monitor your ongoing services, requests in, requests out, with very little effort. It also comes with support for the most popular data science libraries, like Pandas with data frames, which you can render in your user interface, and Plotly. And if you haven't used Plotly, it's an interactive plotting library similar to Matplotlib, except for they are interactive. I prefer it over Seaborn as well because you have more control. It's rapid to deploy and get started with. To run your application, all you need to do is run this command, streamlit run and the name of your file, and that will immediately start a server on your local machine with a URL that you can use to access your front end. It's easy to run, but it's also easy to deploy. You can package it up in a Docker container that you can deploy to a cloud and host as a web app on major cloud services or things like Render. There are two other reasons why I particularly like it, because it's really fast to build. You're not going to waste any time once you know how to use it. And you can use it for demos or prototyping or any time when you want to get input from an end user or a non-technical stakeholder. Right, so that's why you should use it. Now let's get stuck into some Streamlit concepts that you should understand. All Streamlit code is rendered from the top down. 
Now let me explain what that means. Let's take this streamlit code that we've got here. We're importing streamlit and then we're creating three components on our user interface. Starting with the first one, what will happen here is when this code is executed, it's going to start at the top of the main page and display that component. And the component will always take up the full width of the screen. The next component that's rendered in the main window is then always going to be the line below that. And it will continue happening from top to bottom of your script, rendering components as the code is executed. On this third one, what we're doing is we're rendering it on the sidebar by using st.sidebar. And the same thing will happen there if we then executed a second sidebar render, that would appear directly below number three. Something that people find difficult with Streamlit is that whenever you then interact with your front end, the page is going to refresh and all of those components are going to re-render. And so any variables or state that you had stored is going to be lost. We'll learn in a second how we deal with that. There's a concept in Streamlit which I call display context, which is all about where your components are rendered. We saw in the previous example using st.sidebar, but you can also render components in the sidebar using this terminology, which means that everything rendered in this indent is all going to be rendered into the sidebar. Similarly, there are other ways of creating a new context. So we're creating a context here with st.expander and writing inside that. Another, which is one of my favorites, is creating two columns and then we're writing into the first column, creating column one. Let's see how that would look when we render it on our little dashboard. So the first one gets rendered at the top of the sidebar, the expander gets re rendered at the top of the main GUI, and then the next two columns are rendered directly below next to each other. We could then adjust the ratio between those two columns if we wanted one column to be wider or shorter. And these are our building blocks for a Streamlit dashboard. So if we wanted to store any state between refreshes and between when you click on components and the page refreshes, we need to use custom state or session state. Let's see how this works with a simple example of a counter. You might think that you could create a counter in Streamlit with code that looks like this, where you start with a count and then if a button is pressed, increment that counter by one and then print out the count afterwards. However, this does not work in Streamlit because the moment that this button has been pressed, the entire page will rerun with this code being ran on the next invocation only. So it might count the first time, but the second time it's run, it will reset back to one. The way that we actually do it is by using the session state. The session state is available everywhere that you have access to the Streamlit import. We have to initialize what we want to store on there first. So that's what we're doing here. If count not in session state, then initialize it to one. And we're then creating a button Instead of using the if statement this time, we're then saying if it's been clicked, then run this function and increment our count by one. Finally, then we're printing out our count onto the user interface for us to view. Nice, so we've got our counter working. There's two other concepts I want to introduce to you before moving on to a more advanced example. Keys and callbacks. Keys are another way to store information on the session state, where most Streamlit components will have this argument key which allows us to tell Streamlit where we want to store that variable. We can then access it through session state by indexing against it. So that's what keys are. We saw one use for a callback earlier, but another way to use a callback is that when a component has been changed, we can say we want to run this function save to DB and we want to pass in this argument. And that way, anytime the user makes a change to the text in that box, this function is gonna be run with this argument, which can be helpful, especially when it's combined with things like session state. Great, so we've had a quick intro. Let's take a look at a more advanced example with some other features. So I wanted to quickly take you through some of the more advanced features on Streamlit. In this example, I've created a multi-page Streamlit app, and what you're looking at right now is the navigation page. The navigation page is where you tie together all of the different pages of your app. In this particular Streamlit dashboard, we've got two pages, one which is a data upload page and the other which is a data visualization page. Let's take a quick look at what it looks like. So to run our app, we can go to the terminal and write streamlet run streamlet entry point, the name of our file. It's now popped up so we can access the sidebar and we can see the two different pages that we've defined inside our navigation page here. Data upload and data visualization. 
I always like to set my pages to wide, otherwise you end up with a very narrow page right in the middle. So what this app does is you can upload data, view the data frame, select data if you want to. You can then go onto the visualize data tab and plot the axis against each other. This is only meant to be a demonstration of some of the things you can do with Streamlit. What these components look like in code is this file uploader here and we're then reading in the file to display it and saving it out to a local folder. We're then using a select box component to be able to pass in all of the files that are available locally and to select one that we can view. And the similar thing is happening in the data visualization tab. With another select box to choose the file, we're displaying the file, we're reading in the data frame, filtering down to only the numeric columns, creating our select boxes for the axis and then rendering our plotly chart and using the st.plotly chart component to display it. To show you how easy it is to deploy inside a Docker container, there's a Docker file here. Inside our Docker file, we're loading from an official Python image and we're copying across our directory advanced with our entry point to the Streamlit script. We're then copying the requirements that need to be installed in order to run our web app. We're then exposing the port that the Streamlit server is going to be running on. And finally, we're defining our entry point into the script, which is the same command we ran in the terminal a few seconds ago. You can then deploy to places like render really easily directly from your repository if you've got this kind of docker file at the top of your repository. Thanks for watching this introduction to Streamlit tutorial. If you enjoyed the content and it helped you out, please like and subscribe as it'll motivate me to make more of this content. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, otherwise I'll see you next time.